bum, 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 bum. We belong dead. What the hell? Hulk happy to oblige. Oh, good evening. Don't mind me. I'm just having a little bit of fun before the video starts. You know, when it comes to the world of escapism, few things are more entertaining than pitting superheroes against monsters. I know they're two of my favorite things, like Lennon and McCartney or rum and coke. Sure, they're fine on their own, but when you put them together, ah, that's when the magic happens. And tonight, the magic will happen in the form of three Titanic team-ups between some heroes you know and some monsters you don't. So strap in, and I'll see you on the other side. Breakfast! We begin with an entry from our good friends at DC Comics. When it comes right down to it, for being a regular guy with no superpowers, the Batman here has fought a lot of monsters. He's tangled with vampires and swamp creatures, sparred with ancient demons and alien predators. He's even taken on Jack the Ripper and the cosmic horrors of H.P. Lovecraft. In our first tale from Batman Family Number 428, the Cape Crusader battles a beast with the mind of a man, with nothing short of his identity on the line. As our story begins, the Batman is on the trail of a murderer with the power to quite literally tear his victims apart. Our hero discovers his father and the three murdered men all served in the war together, where they provided evidence that convicted scientist Xavier Simon. Now, decades later, Simon enacts his revenge. As Thomas Wayne is long dead, his son Bruce has become the target, and Simon has discovered Bruce is Batman. Through the convoluted logic of comics, Simon manages to develop a mind transference device, placing his deranged consciousness into the body of an albino gorilla in its savage prime. Waking up in a lab after a surprise attack, Batman gets to the heart of Simon's plan. The gorilla while well, nice, it is simply a stopgap. The wicked old man has decided the ultimate revenge will be to hijack the body of Bruce Wayne. The fact that Wayne is secretly Batman, an athlete in peak form, that's just a big old cherry on top. As for Bruce's own psyche, Simon plans on transferring it to his own aged and enfeebled human frame before strangling Wayne to death with his own hands. Pretty gruesome stuff. As you can imagine, Batman doesn't cotton to this plan. He's got a date with Silver St. Cloud tonight. After busting his own chops a bit, old pointy ears gets down to business, tensing the muscles in his body to the point where the table itself splinters under the strain. Not content to simply escape, Batman is determined to put the kibosh on Simon's plans and rips his brain machine off its housing and chucks it at the control console, giving Simon a good scuff in the process. And while initially the madman is concerned about his machines, he quickly realizes the flames have consumed his human body as well. It's a truly macabre moment from Starlin, who's always had the goods when it comes to delivering those powerful storytelling beats. Simon flies into a primal frenzy. Batman has enough sense to turn tail and run until he can gain some advantage, but the enraged albino ape isn't about to let that happen. He chases Batman across the Gotham skyline, eventually bringing our hero down. With nowhere to run and no help to call, Batman lays into his foe. 
were treated to a breathtaking slugfest as the Dark Knight engages this pale primate mono ape mono in a battle for all the beans. <laughs> Batman gives as good as he gets, but in the end, he's just one man against an engine of nature's fury, and our hero is soon delivered his final denouement. Lifting his foe high in the chill night air, Simon prepares to throw Batman to his doom when the unexpected happens. Riddled with bullets, Simon topples from the building to his death. And who is Batman's savior? Why, it's Joe the security guard, who sure as hell doesn't get paid enough to deal with this sort of thing. Make sure you find this guy and give him a little something for his trouble, Bruce. Later, Batman and Commissioner Gordon meet in the graveyard, where the two discuss the case. Unable to completely explain what happened to Gordon due to his personal connection, Bats essentially asks his pal for a gimme on this one. Gordon is reticent, especially after the final bit of weirdness. It seems, before he died, Simon changed his will, leaving everything to one Bruce Wayne. Now, why do you suppose he'd do that? Night of the Body Snatcher is a fun and fast-paced thrill ride from Jim Starlin, who not only wrote this story but provided panel breakdowns as well. Ably finished by P. Craig Russell, this is an underappreciated gem from Batman's Bronze Age, hitting all of the needed beats while still providing a surprise or two. What do I mean? Well, check out the names on those headstones. Next up, when it comes to groan-worthy superhero monster moments, few can compare to the 1990s Catwolf saga. Now, when I think back to reasons why I dropped out of comic books at this point, this is one of the first things that comes to mind. The story was symptomatic of so much that was wrong with comic books at the time. From its bloated six-issue run to its obligatory Wolverine guest appearance, it was the perfect example of creator excess in a time of comic speculation. But Old Winghead wasn't the first superhero to turn into a werewolf. The aforementioned Logan did it. Cap's partner Falcon fell to the spell of the full moon as well. But do you remember the time Doctor Strange became a werewolf? Neither did I, at least until I unearthed this forgotten gem. Like so many issues of Marvel Team-Up I've read over the years, we join a story already in progress. Don't worry, we can fill in the blanks along the way. Somewhere within the shadowy recesses of the Sanctum Sanctorum, there's witchery afoot. Two women ponder the events of the last issue, but while one merely meditates, the other acts. Satana, daughter of Satan himself, uses her uncanny powers to transport Spider-Man and Wong from the tarmac of Kennedy Airport, where the two have failed in their mission to capture a lycanthropized Doctor Strange. Satana discovers the Doctor's plight after her encounter with occult menace, the Silver Dagger, who has been plotting against Strange for some time. But the Doc's cause isn't completely hopeless. He can be cured, as long as they catch him before he kills, or tastes human blood. Spidey is understandably skeptical, but he's out of his league and any ideas, so he goes along for the ride. We get a quick back and forth between Satana and Clea, who questions the stranger's motives. Satana assures Clea that only she has the power now to save Strange, or, barring that, kill him if everything goes wrong. 
Red transports Spidey to Doc's last known location, and it isn't long before Strange is tracked down. He's stalking a hospital, attempting to capture the prey he failed to kill the night before, which is remarkably focused of him. You think being a new werewolf, he'd bite the first person that came along, just to try it out. He won't even bite Spider-Man to get him to stop punching him. I mean, I've heard of having your heart set on a meal, but this strains credibility. Speaking of straining credibility, the girl Doc is determined to put the chomp on is Sissy Ironwood, a gal Spidey was just out on a date with the night before. From being a huge metropolitan city, New York has some mighty small social circles. This provides the impetus needed for Spidey to subdue Strange, who he takes out with a Vulcan nerve pinch. No kidding. As if this weren't all weird enough, Spidey then gives Sissy a kiss through his mask, which raises some significant hygiene issues. But don't dwell on it, we've already been transported back to the Sanctum, where Red begins to undo the spell cast on Strange. To Spidey's surprise, he's stuck in the casting circle with his satanic companion. Turns out the spell needs both masculine and feminine components to work, and old Webhead is the lucky boy. Satana starts cooking, but before she can bring things to a boil, the circle is attacked by dozens of diabolical demons. Drawing upon her formidable magic prowess, Satana repels the invaders while Spidey attempts to keep Doc under control. But, like a dog who's heard the ice cream man coming down the street, Strange has completely lost his shit. It's looking dire for the heroes, but then Satana does the unthinkable, sacrificing herself so she can use the last of her power to restore the good doctor. The deed done, all is as it was. The gate closes, the demons vanish, and Stephen Strange is human once again. Our cast and in turn the reader, are left to mourn the loss of Satana. While never truly good or evil, it's clear that the devil's daughter had the capacity to be of great aid in these troubled times, and this is far from a clean win for our heroes. Written by Chris Claremont, with art by Mike Vosberg, this is a surprisingly solid entry in a series that could be, well, hit or miss. You know, Marvel was willing to team Spidey up with just about anybody, but it didn't always work. It does here, thanks to Spidey's previous relationship with Doctor Strange, established firstly in Amazing Spider-Man number two, or Amazing Spider-Man number one, if you want to count his astral form. Now, I can't say for certain, but it seems as though Claremont was given the order to write Satana out of the Marvel Universe here. A relic of the Marvel Monster magazines of the 1970s, her parentage and overall occult vibe was clearly at odds with the direction that Marvel was headed at the time. If that's the case, Claremont did a fine job of giving her a heroic send-off. Of course, this being comics, it wouldn't be long before Satana was up and kicking around again. Although, I'm sure we've seen the last of Dr. Strangewolf. Lastly, but certainly not leastly, one of my personal favorite comics. I know, that sounds like bullshit, but it's true. I swear to God! <laughs> This is where my mind goes when I think of old comics. Now, if you know me, of course it's an atlas, but uh, it's not just any atlas. It's the atlas. Well, it's not the atlas, but... Uh, all right, hold on. Just let me start again. Join me now on a hot summer's night in 1976. I'd managed to pester some adult into giving me a quarter so I could buy a three-pack of coverless comics from the local grocery store. Now sitting outside of the store waiting in the car, I tore into the package, quickly reading whatever DC and Marvel had been jammed in there. Then I was left with the dreaded third comic, the one you could never quite see no matter how hard you tried to separate the bag. Well, to my disappointment and probable disgust, it was not another Marvel, but instead a comic from a company called Atlas. I was six years old, and what I knew about comics, 
Well, I knew I liked them. <laughs> this wasn't a safe Spider-Man or Superman book. Right off the bat, I could tell this was going to be a little edgier, a little more rock and roll. I mean, check it out. Target is coming through! Now, I didn't know who Target was, but uh, that certainly didn't stop me. But what I thought was going to be just another, albeit more violent, superhero comic quickly turned the corner. Target busts into the lair of mobster Ralph Tabak, who flees to safety behind a steel-reinforced door. Only the true danger waits inside, in the form of an ominous silhouette clutching a grinning skull. It seems that Tabak has betrayed Professor Death, and his life is forfeit. Meanwhile, on the opposite side of the door, Target decides not to knock, instead blasting away with his three fifty seven Magnums. This raises the issue of that steel plating and the very high probability of ricochets, but hey, let's not get bogged down in pesky physics, people. Inexplicably, the door just kind of drifts open. Target, never one of the brightest crayons in the box, obligingly wanders in and is instantly incapacitated by the gas. That said, we get our first glimpse of the old professor, and he is not pretty. Cut to CIA headquarters, where Target's fellow agents fill in the backstory. Meanwhile, across town, an inexplicably alive Taubach makes himself a nuisance at a local lunch counter. Before Flo here can invite him to kiss her grits, a groggy but very pissed-off Target bursts in, intending to finish what he started. Only surprise! Tabak's tie pin is drugged, and for the second time in three pages, Target is knocked unconscious. Our hero, ladies and gentlemen. Luckily, the waitress working the hash joint is also an undercover CIA agent, and she subdues Tabak with a frying pan before summoning a wagon to carry Target back to HQ. There, he's briefed on his foe for the issue, and this is where things really get going. Turns out Professor Death is actually Hannibal Burns, a German research scientist working for the U.S. government on a new type of nerve gas. Encouragingly codenamed Death X-13, the substance turns out to be even deadlier than hoped, blowing up in Burns' face and taking his laboratory with it. However, instead of killing Burns, it gives him weird powers and a face straight out of EC Comics. Hotcha! Target is given the assignment, track down the professor, and stop him from selling his death gas to the highest bidder. But our hero is unsure. He's still woozy from all that gas he breathed in earlier, and besides, his guns are gone. And while both of these seem like valid points, Target is instead rushed out the door with an assurance that he's fine, and his new servo-powered bulletproof supersuit will give him all the power he needs to stop his foe. Target finds the professor in a boat basin on Manhattan's Upper West Side. He sneaks onto the ship and overhears Death's plan to consolidate his criminal empire. Before Target can react, he's attacked by the professor's henchman, Jonathan. No need for an intimidating nickname when you get it right the first time, I guess. He and Johnny throw hands, and to Target's surprise, he beats the crap out of his bigger, stronger opponent, throwing Jonathan overboard for good measure. At that moment, death appears, and Target decides to play along, allowing himself to be bolted to a wall. The professor, in spite of his irritation at Target's interference, is impressed, and wishes to recruit our boy into his organization. Target ain't having it, and busts free, snagging a death skull in the process. The gas clears the room so that he and the professor might battle one-on-one. -on -one. It's a fair scrap, but in the end, Target prevails. Thanks to a combination of the gas in his system and his new suit, he's strong. Powerful. In fact... He feels great. He punches his way out of the boat, then punches it again to make it explode. How the same explosion doesn't blow him up at least a little bit, we're not given the chance to ponder, as it's the end of the book and time to give a rousing little speech. No more a passive target, our hero has emerged a fully formed man-stalker. Reading back through it now, and I can see that 
Nostalgia goes a long way in making something a personal favorite. The story here isn't especially well written or witty, and our main character isn't terribly bright or sympathetic. This book doesn't really cover any new ground, despite its willingness to show a little more violence and grit. In the end, it's Howard Nostrand's art that's the secret, transforming an otherwise middling tale into a comic that's something raw and compelling. Howard Nostrand was an American cartoonist and illustrator best known for his work on pre-code horror comics from the 1950s. His ability to emulate contemporaries like Jack Davis and Wally Wood ensured he had lots of work through 1954, but after the implosion caused by the imposition of the comics code, Nostrand went to work in the field of advertising. 1975 saw Nostrand return, providing art for Atlas, Marvel, and Cracked Magazine. Sadly, the only work Nostrand did for Atlas was on target, and when the three-issue run was up, the artist moved on to greener pastures. That said, these books remain a pleasure to look at, a bit of that old pre-code magic showing up in the oddest of places. If you enjoyed this episode, gently but firmly depress that like button. If it really blew your hair back, consider throwing a few bucks into the old guys who like old comics tip hat. Anything that you toss our way goes towards making the kind of content that you can only find here on the Old Guys Who Like Old Comics Network. I'm Jason Mink, and I hope to see you next week at breakfast. <laughs>